<laughs> the fan is drying out my eyes. Okay. <laughs> Warming up. So you can see it takes so much space. Yeah, because someone managed to find all this. It is the Kickstarter we did it back, but then we ended up like we have the Kickstarter. <laughs> No, no, we back to Kickstarter. We did. Yeah, but through, ano, through, not direct, other person, right? It was one of those group ship things. Yes, yes. Starting in a bit, if yes, manually resharing our links, I guess someone has to. Self-promotion is key. We've been doing this for nearly a year, and we still don't get more than 10 people <laughs> on a regular basis. It's a labor of love, guys. It's a labor of love. They're tagging the Toby. Now all my chats are notifying that Toby is sharing. I've seen dark. Hmm? Why is it just my computer? I uh, mean, maybe the monitor again. Um, yeah, I guess it's just my computer. Hard to tell. It just seems dark. Yes. It could be because my brightness is low, so it doesn't reflect. Mm -hmm. Now it's reflecting the lights. We'll be starting in a minute. It's a board game Monday. <coughs> so, yes. Starting in one minute. Okay, 920. I guess we might as well start. Okay. So if people are watching, as usual, please comment, please like, please share, get more people to join. We, we um, can't see if you're watching until we, we you can't, comment. We can't see you. You have to speak up. At the same time, if you're watching this in the future, after this live, hello. <laughs> so let's okay. start. Let's start. This is Toby. And this is Rocky. And if it's your first time here, welcome to Buddy Pride, our little space on the internet where we talk about anything we want. It's completely unscripted and not entirely accurate, but at least it's honest. Join us as we talk about everything and anything random live. And if it's not your first time here, thank you so much for joining us again. It's another Monday, which means it's another day we talk about games. And and what are we talking about today, Toby? I don't know. What could it be? <laughs> <laughs> Today we're talking about Tang Garden, a massive board game. Hey Christian! Hello! And this board game is so massive it needs three boxes! To be fair, because they're expansions. I will have to admit that we don't know what base Tang Garden really is. No, no, this no, no. is base. I'm not sure, because the Kickstarter did accomplish unlocking 45 stretch goals. So the yeah. base game is already composed of some stretch goals as well. No, no. Okay. Because the base game is the base game. But what became the golden age 
is essentially the Kickstarter stretch goals. Okay. And then Ghost Stories is like the official expansion. So all 45 are in the other boxes? Practically. Because so that's buy... like, because like, you have to count the individual characters, the individual decorations they added, mm. uh, the things like that. So that's, that's, that's the story of this. And it's funny that the stretch goals became enough to become a expansion in itself. Mm-hmm. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's talk about Tang Garden. <clears throat> so Tang Garden came out officially last year, mm-hmm. uh, uh, mainly by Kickstarter. And we, we were very happy when it arrived. It was one of the highlights of the pandemic period. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, in Tang Garden, uh, because the Tang Dynasty was considered the first golden age of the classical and now iconic Chinese gardens, Emperor Xuan Zong built the magnificent imperial garden of the majestic Clear Lake as an homage of life itself and from where he ruled. So we are imperial garden designers Mm -hmm. and we are trying to build the most incredible garden while balancing different elements of nature. So Tang Garden describes itself as a zen-like game that will take to the first golden age of China where players will progressively build a garden by creating the landscape, placing the scenery, projecting their vision through vertical panoramas, and during the construction, noblemen will visit the garden to admire the surroundings and the way the natural elements coexist in the most breathtaking scenery humankind has ever laid their hands on. Eyes on, sorry. Now, it might sound like there's a lot of buzzwords in that description, but surprisingly, the Zen. game actually Panorama. does capture a lot of those things in the gameplay yes in terms of nobles visiting yes that's part of the gameplay in terms of feasting their eyes on the view yes that's part of the it's game literally play. it's literally part of the game where they're looking so let's talk about <coughs> the game we'll break it down to the different components but know that this is a game that has set collection card drafting tile placement variable play playable powers and um, if you took the time to, if you took the effort to get the Kickstarter edition, that's so much goodies. So many goodies. Yes. Um, so. so yeah, it's hard to play this vanilla anymore for us. Toby is still trying to open the box. It's a... Uh, it has a vacuum seal. It has good book, box part. Game goes for one to four players. Beautifully, immaculately designed. Artwork is just... Yeah, with a UV press type polished. thing. Treatment. Okay. And upon opening, you will find yourself feasting your eyes on a box that is prepared to keep the things. Uh, there are slots to keep the board from wiggling. There are little zones for each of the components, as you can see here. It's a very well-designed insert without going full like game trays, I'll admit. And this is despite having so many components. Yes. Um, the board is a board that opens in multiple folds but notice there are these holes or slots present on the board yes you are seeing a board that's predominantly white and brown that looks boring and that's intentionally part of the design yeah because you start out sort of with a blank canvas and then as you play styles you're you're kind of coloring in the garden mm-hmm. and which is really cool the slots on the side notice they're like wiggly lines mm-hmm. because they're meant to hold yeah. um cardboard uh, little little panorama pieces like this that notch into it mm-hmm. and the the wiggly curve design is such that it holds them in place without requiring additional locking mechanisms players have their own player boards which have holes in them this allows it's upside you- down <laughs> this allows you to keep track of your progress in the different types of tiles you've played whether it's water uh, not tiles, but uh, different garden types. parts of the garden. Yeah, parts of the garden you built. Whether it's water features, garden features, or stone features, mm-hmm. you have the area for what we call your lanterns, which are special powers that are variable depending on what you choose to play. They're technically the one-time use, unless another lantern does something. You also have these icons at the top, which are things you unlock whenever you have all three meters meet or cross that area. So it has that Carcassonne feel where. And this, and this is the starting tile. And you'll notice that there is a rock border element. Then you have a, a water element here. You have plants on top. So it's it has different features. And the tiles will connect 
um, in that manner. So kind of like Carcassonne, uh, everything has to match for it to mm -hmm. be a legal placement. Um, so that is part of the gameplay wherein the tiles matter. Um, what do you want to fight? Well, the ones that connect to this, but you brought it up already. Oh, well, it was just that uh, initial opening. Yeah. So the game has a stack of tiles, and these stacks of tiles are broken down to four types. They're spread out on the board, and each round, players draw from the tiles in order to complete features. The, the the tiles do make four stacks around the board where there's a green one, a blue one, a, a yellowish brown one, and a yin yang symbol one, which is kind of wild. And even though you draw a green tile, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all green. It may still have water features, mm -hmm. it may still have earth sides. But in theory, by getting a particular color tile, you are most likely getting mm -hmm. a particular type of feature. Beyond the tiles, you have what they call the backgrounds. There are the smaller ones, such as these. And the big ones. Um, these are all part of what are added to the board by players because each, these, each of these backgrounds, if you look carefully, have icons on them. So the big ones. And these icons are part of the scoring mechanism at the end of the game in terms of what are the nobles looking at. Speaking of nobles... So the base game features a lot of different characters, which, unfortunately, um, I have not memorized how to place them back in this container. So, And the container doesn't perfectly, perfectly only fit one character in each slot. Mm -hmm. I keep resorting to a photo I took at the beginning when we unboxed it. Each noble has their corresponding card because the cards are used to randomize which nobles are in play at the time. Players use the nobles in order to activate certain powers or skills that are shown here in the bottom. Some of them are more powerful during the game. Others are tremendously powerful at the end of the game. And part of your decision making is whether or not a noble stays active while you play or whether you have them visit the garden and no longer help you until the end of the game. Yeah, so if you very quickly, without explaining the symbols in detail, the upper part is the active ability when they're not yet placed in the garden. The lower part is the end of game scoring mechanic mm -hmm. if you place them in the garden, but you give up the active power. And uh, some depending on the symbols, and you know, the, the manual um, will help you in this regard as to which symbol means what. Some scoring conditions are based on everything in their line of sight. So in their their direct row mm -hmm. uh, where they're facing. Whereas others are based on the completed panorama or backgrounds that they are also facing, which are the these little standing tiles earlier. So you need to have a complete set of two big ones and three small ones in order to trigger those scoring abilities. So other things we have, we have the bag of coins. Non-Kickstarter would have the generic cardboard, cardboard coins. Ones. Yeah. Um, if you paid for the full, you might get special coins. You have little tokens for the decorations because decorations are part of the way you can boost points in the game depending on the corresponding decorations cards that you are able to choose from. There's an intricate system that exists in terms of the relationship of decoration cards and tiles. The number of decoration cards you draw in a turn depends on how many tiles have been revealed from the piles. So timing when to grab decoration cards is vital, especially because as you, if you look at decoration cards, different cards require different slots. Mm -hmm. um, trees, for example, need to have garden slots open, whereas Koi fish, on the other hand, might need water slots available. And if you are unfortunate like me and happen to draw decorations that have no slots available, then you don't get to put decorations down. Yeah, there's a funny mechanic where because there are four different piles of tiles, when you take a garden tile from one of those stacks, you don't immediately replace it. So it remains face down for that stack. And the number of face down garden stacks um, will be your additional Bonus decoration cards, cards that, you that you will draw. Yes. But the moment that there is only what, one. Two? One. Only one um, visible garden tile, 
then they all automatically, uh, the other three automatically flip open. Mm-hmm. Thus, eliminating your decoration bonus. To, but, just, to just a basic, yeah. But opening up garden spots. More, uh, more beyond that, we got the wooden tokens, which are used to trap the near player board. Yes. We have the noble token, because when certain portions of the player board are reached that allow you to get a new noble, you can choose to get this token instead if you want to delay getting that noble. And finally, we have the stuff that appear in the garden. Let us get the board so we can display it. There. Okay. So let's start with those. So we have bridges. Mm-hmm. It's very cute, but it's a bridge, and they need to be placed on specific bridge slots on the tiles. We have trees, and trees come in four varieties. Very photosynthesis. Ah. Okay. Let, let left behind. You left some of the tree. Um, yeah. And trees are a unique, uh, what's it, or a set building mm-hmm. mechanic. By where having all colors. More unique trees, you get more points. Sort of like the dumplings and sushi go. And then, oops, the roof oh, wow. fell off. That fell off. Well, there were times it was sitting on its side, I think. That's yeah. why. Ah! Okay, I can't fix this I'll right do now. it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And then you have your little pagodas. Pagodas! Pagodas serve as other places where nobles can stand in. Um, there's a set collection aspect as well to pagodas. Having more of them means you will have more points at the end of the game. So you have all these beautiful, colorful pieces. You have the colorful tiles. And remember that plain black and white board earlier? That's why it is plain. As you play and add these things, more and more your board gets wonderfully colorful. Because you're filling out your garden. And um, these spots that allow, which are marked with a little seal symbol, which you can kind of see there, Mm -hmm. um, it's also inside the pagoda, which is hard to see, are the viewing spots. And at key points in the game, when you filled up uh, all your colored meters up to a line, um, then you can choose to uh, swap in another leader, another noble, and then you must decide where to place them. Mm-hmm. And placement includes literally where they're going to stand and what they will be facing as they are placed on the board. <clears throat> to quickly try to illustrate it, um, and sadly, yes, that, so it's a plain white board. Uh, the background? Can you have a background? Oh, sure. So large background would connect. There, look at that, look at that. See, it connects to that hole. Small backgrounds. They're inside, I think, or you put them aside. <coughs> um, let's just get one small background and it goes in there. <coughs> You're on the hinge point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Now let's say we played some tiles. Then you could see here in the whiteboard with the tiles, it suddenly gives it a pop of color. Oh, good job, your placement's legal. So let's just add a bit more. So yeah, they clearly went through a Carcassonne style design process to make sure that you know different feature types can always link together. So there we can <coughs> see that there slightly. Let's see if we can prop this a bit with the player boards. <laughs> I don't know if we should just move the camera. <laughs> eh, sort of ish. <laughs> yeah. And then if a pagoda <coughs> was present. Yeah, it has to be there. That's a legal placement. And then if a tree was present. Also legal placement. And if another tree was present. So you can see how as you're playing. It's all starting to get very colorful, and I dropped it again. Yeah, because uh, the board's bending. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Isn't that beautiful? It's just such a beautiful game. Now, you might be wondering how complex is the gameplay, given how pretty and how intricate intricate everything seems to interconnect. That is where it's going to take a bit of effort to teach because we won't be able to visually present each one. Yeah, there's a, I guess because the challenge is figuring out a lot of the scoring mechanics and um, it's like uh, getting decoration cards kind of are a bit more straightforward. For example, peonies, if you have only one, it's zero points. But if you have a pair of a peony, and the other flower that paired with it, I forget what it's called, 
um, then you get six points. And then mm -hmm. there's another, there's the birds and the koi fish and the koi, similar thing. If you have a set, then Each you get pair. six. Yeah. yeah. And then the bridges will give you two points at the end of the game and sometimes will give you mm -hmm. um, elemental movement on the board mm -hmm. um, and, and so on and so forth. So the cards are kind of a little easier to get. But then it's really the noble powers that are going to be hard things to figure out. Like, sometimes you get bonuses every time you score um, green features or yellow features. or um, And then that's mid-game. Mm -hmm. Or things like every time you get a peony, you'll, you'll draw another one or something like that. So they have their own noble abilities. But at the end of the game... Um, then it really matters. Then, like sometimes I need, I get points for every um, earth feature in my line of sight, mm -hmm. or I get points if the completed background I am facing con contains the deer icon, mm -hmm. you know, and you count the number of deer icons that appear. There are some nobles that have interesting interactions. The empress, for example, does not want to see the emperor. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, there's like a mistress thing going on, I don't know. It's there like, are some that other. prefer certain features, and having them in the line of sight is always additional points. Um, there are some powers brought by lanterns that allow you to reposition or redirect your facing. Um, given that each turn, you basically have two things you do. First is you choose a matching tile to play. Um, if not the matching tile, you draw from the decorations and choose a decoration to play. Mm -hmm. And then the second is, um, after you've done that, is you basically check if you need to replenish the stacks or if it's the next player's turn. The gameplay can actually move much faster than expected. Um, it's not uncommon to feel at first like you're not sure what you're doing and you just get happy building the map because by building the garden, um, as mentioned, there's a Carcassonne feature in the sense of you want to try to complete features. When you play a tile and it closes off a, let's say, a forest feature, because if you look at the forest and trace it, your tile actually closes it off and completes it. Mm -hmm. Then you would score points in that elemental aspect. Um, but alternately, you could simply choose to match the sides of pathways you still get in order points. to get coins faster. Oh, and, yes. and while coins are worth points at the end of the game, um, there are times that you will want to find ways to create these combos, whether it's you delay filling something up so that you fill it later because you're timing when it will hit the player board or because you're aware of someone planning to do something so you need to snatch that other things instead first. So what we haven't been able to illustrate, which kind of is the other part of the game, is that when you start, when you start the game, there are going to be these little tiles on little tokens on them that mark the that mark the um, panoramas whether it's big or small and one of the end game triggers is when there are when you are down to only three of those tokens in the end it's in the uh, it's box. in the ghost box okay <laughs> admittedly yeah, the, the 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 kickstarter nature of things blends everything together so yeah, yeah, I think they're... They had them here. No, there. So the tokens? Ah, there's a lantern. Yeah, they yeah. Okay. I will bring out some. They are typically cardboard, but then when they when you have the, the bonus stuff, then they're tokens. So one is like a Bahai Kubo, and then the other is So the mountain. tokens are spread out in specific patterns depending on how you set up the game at the start. That's in the middle. Uh, the different patterns depend on the different modules or the different game modes you choose to play. Some game modes are more generous, other game modes are more complicated, and then there are even game modes that are designed for solo play, game modes that are designed for, I think there was a, there's one for teams, right? Mm. Um, and these different game modes determine how easy or how challenging it is to complete or collect those uh, background tokens. And part of the reason that those background tokens matter is that they are one of the end game triggers. Yes. If ever you reach a point in the game that there are, I think, Three mm -hmm. or three, three tokens three. left. Then that becomes the last round, and trust me, it's so frustrating because it's an instant last round. It's not a everyone gets a last round. Yeah, it's like bye, you know. And then um, you are going to 
you're going to acquire a total of five nobles in the game. The one you start with and four more. At least that's the maximum that you can acquire. Mm-hmm. So it is possible, though, for the end game trigger to happen before you even get to like your third noble. Because yes. if you're not, mo- if you're only moving in one elemental trap, you will not get your nobles. You'll have to balance against the three. Now, in as much as the tiles and the cards make it already feel like every game is different, even the lantern powers, and we can see some of the icons here. The back looks more like this: a lantern. Uh, even this adds a further element of how different each game session is. Especially if you get the expansion. At the start, <laughs> you have four Lantern Powers. Yes. They range from being able to play a second tile immediately. To draw being, another Decker card. Yeah, being able to draw another Decker card. Or uh, being able to reposition a Noble to look a certain other way. <laughs> or switch a Noble with the one you already have with someone else on the reserve. But then the expansions add other powers and... Um, We've tried mixing a few and we have really felt how different it gets because your brain might be so used to a certain stratagem and then just by switching around the powers, you realize, oh, wait, I can't do that. And because the manuals, especially for the expansions, come with different setups, this includes what lanterns to include, um, additional tiles Mm -hmm. to place, all these things. So it's so much fun. So um, if you were one of the people who, like me, got the Kickstarter edition, then you would have possibly gotten all the other expansions. And they include bags, nice tokens, the metal coin, first which player acts token. as a first player token. But to briefly touch on the expansions, Ghost Stories adds a ghost tree. Yes. It's that ghost tree. But more importantly, it adds a 10-sided die that has a way to generate what expansion you'll use. You get a few more characters, but look! Those little black things, they're cats. It adds cats. Because of course if they're ghosts, there are cats that talk to them. New characters, uh, new noble cards, new decorations as, such as the spectral tree and a few other twists. Um, new backgrounds. We have new minor backgrounds. We have larger backgrounds. And then even new tiles with new effects. Notice the metal shiny, shiny on this one. Um, yeah, there. It's a dragon tile. Um, and then notice also how there are similarly new tiles with similarly shiny elements. So it doesn't show that much here. Yeah, but there's that metallic circle blue thing. So, um, so it's a host <coughs> of new little techniques, new expansions, and new systems. It kind of reminds me of how when when you play Carcassonne, the expansion has these little systems that you have to be aware of. Um, and that's Ghost Stories. We haven't gotten the Golden Age. Golden Age is actually the, the predominantly, this is the Kickstarter bonuses. And mm-hmm. because it's a lot more straightforward uh, in the sense that it gives you <clears throat> eight more characters because why not? Eight more of these guys. Another die, which has effects. That's the randomizer. Um, more background pieces of both types. More decors, more tiles. Yeah, this one has the no. It has the. There's a butterfly <laughs> and then. The mariposa. And yeah, mariposa. all these other things. Um, and then these are the old lanterns, <laughs> and it gave lantern powers. So, mm-hmm. um, lots of fun stuff. Lots of fun stuff. Um, annoyingly, there is no one box that contains everything. Because this was a Kickstarter release that kind of blew up in the stretch goals department, mm-hmm. then you end up with three separate boxes where some of the components came in the Ghost Stories box and then some of them were here. And we have we have mixed and matched to sort of like figure out what we're playing so with. So to imagine some of the effects that happen with the new expansions, uh, the butterflies allow you to... Ex- uh, to Refresh an exhausted lantern so your powers can be used again. But it doesn't give money. <laughs> the ducks allow you to advance twice on a player board. So it allows you to really rush forward sometimes when you need to. Bonsai allow you to gain more coins. But then you lose coins the more bonsai you have because you're not supposed to be hoarding them. Um, it's like a fancy restaurant. In the Nymphaea or the fountains earn you more coins as well. But again, you lose coins if you have more bonsai. Um... Actually, Bonsai, Ninfea, and the base. So the three actually interrelate with each other. Having a single card gives you seven coins immediately. 
But for every other of the other things, you lose coins. So it might reach a point you're not getting coins when you have them. Um, then there are new lantern tokens. There's one that allows you to switch a uh, noble. And there's one that allows you to draw five garden tiles from any stack. Then keep one. And then you'll choose one and return the four. So it adds all these little techniques and stratagems you can open. So, Tang Garden. Um, <clears throat> I think it's safe to say as far as if it's uh, artwork, how pretty, super high marks. pretty, super pretty. The cards are nicely readable. The iconography is clean. Um, the artwork is beautiful and to die for. Um, let's just show this one because it's a larger blow up the artwork. Yeah. Whoops, so, okay, there. This is from the, the Ghost Stories expansion. The cards are reasonably <coughs> designed. You could see there's large spaces for the icons and the artwork. Likewise here. The game the game went smart by having a lot of symbols so that it, it's not as much reading. But the problem also is that there's a lot of symbols. Someone has to read them at the beginning. And then you're going to be referring to the manual a few times while you figure things out. They <coughs> talk to prominent colors. So you can easily see what colors are when it comes to the elements. The printing quality was also well done. So you can actually see the colors of those elements. Iconography suffers slightly, though, when it comes to the backgrounds. Yeah, because like... Like, look at this big, beautiful background. But then look at the symbol, which is in the corner. Um, and, I mean, sometimes it's pretty intuitive. For example, the symbol on this one is a dragon because the background has a dragon. Whereas the symbol on this has a dragon and a little village house thing. But then how do you differentiate? Some have a pagoda. And you know, it's like there's there's like stuff that's not super super um, intuitive every time, mm -hmm. and there's going to be a lot of squinting at the board, especially since you can place these backgrounds on the orthogonal uh, sides of your board. Then you'll have players all going like, "What what's what's the symbol on that?" And then and then peeking. Um, the 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 funny thing, which is which is delightful and frustrating at the same time is the fact that line of sight is so important. And thus, you will literally find yourself staring down the board and thinking, is this where I want to put my person mm -hmm. so that they, they align with all these bonuses? Because for uh, the main point being, the more decorations you put in their line of sight, then that's, immediate that's, that's one more point per decor in line of sight. That includes... The flowers, the animals, the pagodas, the bridges, the trees, uh, all these things. <clears throat> but then, is that is that enough to get you to win when your your end game objective still requires you to look at certain things? Mm -hmm. um, Mitch is asking, typical running time for the game. Surprisingly, we've never felt this game takes too long. It does not feel long. In fact. Uh, there has been many instances we're enjoying the game so much we're annoyed it has to end. Yeah, we have literally had point because I feel like the end game trigger that is most likely to happen is when you start running out of the panorama, mm -hmm. the panorama tile things, and we have built gardens around the tiles just so that we stretch it a bit yes. longer before we trigger end game. Mm -hmm. Um, but the fact that the player does have some level of control on when the end game trigger does happen um, is an interesting feature in the game. Uh, for example, Suburbia, which has a similar joy in building combos and laying down tiles, um, it catches you by surprise. You know, you draw a tile, oh, it's the last round, mm -hmm. and you don't have a choice. Um, Carcassonne, you can feel the bag, and you're like, guys, two tiles left, and the game is ending. <laughs> Here. Um, the closest thing to that is if you run out of the stacks. But from experience, we <coughs> always trigger endgame due to the background tokens being taken, then the stacks. Because you see, the backgrounds, because of like at least, I guess you could say that half the characters will score based on completed backgrounds. And realistically, in a Tang Garden game, you will be able to definitely complete two, two sets of backgrounds. Mm -hmm maybe three, but never all four because there are because of the limitation on tiles. And um 
there will there's a silent war of what symbols you're trying to arrange so that it benefits the character you intend to place mm-hmm. in the garden assuming you actually acquire the character and you're not just looking at the open face stacks on the board and then yes. hoping to swipe it because so it there's a lot of planning there's a lot of open planning that ends up happening now the game is also notorious for being a shared location so you might be setting down the decorations and mapping out what you want and then someone else places their noble there and gets those points or you might find yourself hoping to build this background with the icons you need but then the other players it's open information they can see the nobles you have so they might put backgrounds there <clears throat> that ruin what you were hoping to build and it's interesting how um it almost feels like you don't have to pay attention to it but you do because even decorations because of the fact that there are limited slots for decoration type then you might be mapping out that i'm going to put a little duck in that lake in the pond but then Toby decides to put some freaking lilies then you're out of water slot so even if you draw the the decorations that you kind of want mm-hmm. if you don't have legal placements then you can't do it so same thing with like this this open earth space can put a can put a pagoda mm-hmm. um but then if you don't have any then you can't put it then you can't win pag- pagoda majority then what are you going to do so the game does, the game also does have that uh, what people universally call the monopoly rule if the object is uh, if you've run out of that component then you cannot build that anymore and we've had many instances of oh i want to oh, there's no more pagodas or okay i can build a bridge no, Wait, more, bridge. no more bridges there's like only six bridges in the game or four and, and remember and even worse oh trees but the card specifies the tree and you know there's only two of each color so it's tricky it's nice um it's challenging in that aspect there's a little bit of luck involved but surprisingly it never feels unfair super unlucky yeah yeah because there's you always have options and, i mean like and you have some level of control like, yes uh, i'm notorious for bad luck and if this game was always just two decoration cards every time then i'd hate it but the fact that i can time it and draw four if i'm lucky yeah then you know it, it gets me even more interesting that way um what else there's a tension to be taken as well on when you collect those background tokens because beyond just getting backgrounds to place onto the panoramas um you can cash in those tokens the number depending on what rule set you're using and how many players are playing in order to refresh and use again lantern powers that you already have but typically it means that you have to have matching background tokens mm-hmm. which means have you only been building the big backgrounds or the small ones it's uh it's very true now some warnings um in as much as the the iconography is clean there are a lot of very similar iconography which sadly um can make it hard to get used to at first like the rock spot which you need for pagodas and the symbol for viewing spots which is that circle Mm-hmm. Although completely different, but when you're first staring at the board, you're like, is it the same? Mm-hmm. Especially when a circle symbol appears on a mountain-like structure, but it is not a rock spot, so you can't put a pagoda. And then likewise, you have the the brick walls that can be used to complete and close uh, features. Mm. But then you have the the rooftops, like the green rooftop and the red rooftop, which closes off something similar to the uh, cloister, no, not cloister. Uh, which one was this? It was one of the expansions in Carcassonne. The one that fits in a perfect square. But you remember, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayor... Cathedral? No. Cathedrals. Cathedrals. Just like the cathedrals. Um, so it's just annoying that uh, you know, there were some... Or was it the Abbey? Might have been the Abbey. Cathedral, that has the double score. There were some anyway. slips in terms of the visual communication in those aspects, which is a bit sad. Um... The manual also sadly did not clarify um, garden feature type with tile type. So there are yeah. times when it says whenever you complete water, you're now wondering, does that mean that the blue tiles, which are the water tiles, or does that mean the water feature? So it takes some time sometimes to get the used to yeah, it. Yeah, and, 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 and if the answer there is it's the feature and not the mm-hmm. tile. Because at first we were thinking, like when we first finished the game and we we're going to score, And they were like, I score for every blue I see. 
So do we flip over the tile? Yeah. And like look at the under if it's blue? No, you don't. You just look at the features that are visible in the end game space. So again, um, Time Garden has ghost stories and Golden, Golden Age. Age. I, I, I'm not sure like if you can get all in retail. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little confused on that because of the fact that it's one of those situations where um, the expansions came out with the Kickstarter. Now, there are a number of other smaller expansions, which we actually probably don't own. Yeah, we don't, um, because they were add-ons that you had to yes, buy separately. So that includes Swans, the Wayfarers, the Herbalists, um, and Apricot Trees. And I've seen some people selling these independently, and it's been tempting to buy them. But I don't know if I'm willing to shell out that much money for just a few more cards. I mean, to be fair, Oh, are we back? Yeah, we should be back now. I hope we're back. Are we back? That's are we back? That's are we egg? Are we back? Are we back? Ah, I see stars. Okay, okay, I think we're back. Yeah, okay, I can see the monitor. We're back. Yes, that this is, is happening. Huh? These last few days, we have to start reporting that. I guess maybe they did an update and they don't realize that's been happening. Yeah, but, it's always around ten. Is it similar to our nine o'clock problem? Before it was the nine problem. Yeah. Okay. So, Time Garden. Um, strategies. Pay attention to the nobles. Plan ahead. Um, you can there see what two or three nobles yeah, visible at any point. You can see the time. available nobles, but you also know what nobles the other players have. So, plan ahead. Just pay attention to the spots that they will most likely get, and don't put decorations in those spots, or get that spot, or if they got the spot, there is still a chance. What we end up happening, especially when a lot of decorations are in a particular line, uh, then you'll start seeing noble rows where you start building viewing spots behind that previous viewing mm -hmm. spot just so that everybody's looking in the same direction. Because thankfully, they don't block each other's lines. Yeah, it's, it's just funny. Except for some nobles who don't like people in the way. Yeah, yeah. So, But that's not so bad. As long as, as, long as the, you know, it meets your scoring conditions, then that's a possibility. And then never, 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 never underestimate any of the decorations. Yes. Some of them don't seem super effective, especially when you've drawn like your third peony and like where, where is my lotus, whatever? Where's my lily to match it? But then it may happen later on and, and there, then things and, will go well. And even if you're not creating the sets, you are still keeping others from building their own sets. And you're adding decorations to the board. So that's still more points for a lot of people. Mm. Pay attention to combos. Um, while Carcassonne, uh, the combos were assuming you had the meeples already in place. Or a phantom. Here, you don't necessarily have the people to be in place. But just by placing down something and it completes multiple things is so satisfying. Especially when you planned it and others did not realize you were making the perfect move. And then you have to really appreciate your player track because you get bonuses when all three colors meet certain milestones. Mm -hmm. But it's not bad for one color to go all the way to the end because the last few slots are just coins. Yes. So there's points for getting to the end of the line, but there's there's but you also need to trigger when your nobles come in by getting all three together. Um, and that's really, I think, the core balance of the game sometimes there's a rush to like okay let's just keep putting let's just keep putting let's keep putting let's, let's, let's keep doing garden features mm -hmm. but then if you're not ready and you haven't planned it um you're kind of touch move then you don't know where you're going to put your noble and if you haven't mapped that out where you already have developed a spot that already has like a decent number of points for the scoring mechanic of that noble then you'll get caught unawares. Mm -hmm. There is the option to reserve, like Toby showed earlier. You can take the noble reservation tile thing, whatever. But if you cross to the next noble marker, 
and you still have not claimed the previous you one, it. you forfeit. Yeah. So suddenly you're down one noble, whereas other players might be able to score four. Keep in mind that playing tiles means more more than not you will move in terms of your player track. Playing decorations has a smaller chance of moving in the player track because that's then dependent on specific decorations that do give you that bonus. But pay attention to the cards because sometimes you get so used to like, oh, I'll play a bridge, it's two points at the end of the game. But some of the bridges have color symbols mm, that will points. also give you, well, yeah, it will always give the two coin thing at the end of the game, but it can also give movement on the track. But not all of them do. Same thing with pagodas and other things. So pay attention to the cards because there are slight variations on the different decoration cards and it will make all the difference. Uh, and then I think my last tip would be if you do own this, take photos. Because it's so stressful to try to remember what best goes where afterwards. Yeah, just just the player, just the meeples alone in the different boxes. There are so you saw there are three different meeple, I don't know, three mini inserts. Um, and then some of them kind of sort of fit in multiple slots. So I took pictures of each, thankfully, because we did a slow unboxing, mm -hmm. and then I still have to pull up those darn photos. Every time we're putting it back. I think we've at least memorized how to put things back into the main box. And it's really a very specific order. It's pagodas, trees, uh, the small backgrounds, the bridges on the side, players on top, all these things. There's like a very specific sequence for everything. The others, the one, which is funny, there's a lot of space in these two boxes. That's not super... Not super, super optimal. They don't connect. No. They're independent backgrounds. They don't connect. Okay, is this what you want to make as a thumbnail? Uh, 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 where, where do I go? I'll go there. And then... Okay. So we'll, we'll, we may use that later. Yeah. The, but the, the pieces are quite, are just lovely. The production of this game is definitely very high end. It was a very good Kickstarter. I mean, just look at even just the look at the shininess on this on this cover with the foil press. I mean, it's very extra. It's very very extra because it's, it's a very very good Kickstarter. I think if you search for Thank Garden Game, you're gonna get an ad for a gaming library. Um, they are like one of the first ones to come up, um, which is not a bad thing. So looking at the artist Matthew Mizak or Mizak, mm. uh, the same artist has done art for a bunch of other games. Including Ao, Dead Man's Doubloons, um, a lot of War Games, hmm. Legend Raiders, and Valda. Um, on the other hand, in terms of the designers, because there's a pair of them, you have Perluca Zizi and you have Francesco Testini. Francesco Testini has 19 games listed. That includes 15 Days, Golems, Legend Raiders, Mom Momiji. Um, a lot of them I don't know. And Cian. Whereas Zizi has um, some more familiar titles such as Three Secrets, Arcanum, um, Barbarians, Dark Tales, um, where was that? And Hyperbore Hyper, eh? Hyperborea, mm. which are some of the games that I've seen before but haven't tried. Uh, for us, this is our first experience with this this duel. Yeah, and um, then this publisher, and we're, Thundergriff. And we're very happy. I know when I supported the Kickstarter, it was because I was just marveling at how pretty it looked. And when I was reading the rules, I was more intrigued because it sounds like a lot of games we like. It's the tiling aspect of Carcassonne. It's like the journey kind of scoring mechanic of Tokaido. Mm -hmm. The garden building of Takenoko. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of different stuff. And, and then to discover there was a line of sight system. The line of sight is just great. And really, we've had so many games where you start going like this. And sadly, uh, that's where the icons in the backgrounds gets annoying because they're so small. And you can't exactly like do this to the board to look at them. So it gets a bit tricky sometimes to see those. But otherwise, I think it is still worth the effort. 
Uh, the game's a bit expensive. I do not. I'm not aware of any digital version existing. Yes. Places like Tabletop Simulator might have versions that might allow you to play it digitally, but I will warn you, um, you have to take some time to learn the systems. Mm -hmm. It's probably, in terms of complexity, less complex than Vital Lazar the games, but uh, a bit up there. This would be more complex than Lord of, Lords of Waterdeep. Yeah, and then, but ultimately, points are coins, and then everything just gets converted to coins, so it's not terrible. It's funny, the end game scoring, I think, I forgot what the number was, but it's like, uh, you can't, you can't, you're most likely can't score more than like 10 or 12 points maximum for a noble. It was something mm -hmm. like that, we figured out the math, eh? You know it from the sun and moon. Yeah, because those nine, annoying sun and moon nine, ones. I think nine was like the uh, the high peak for the uh, empress. Oh no, for the sun and moon. So beyond nine is already high. Yeah. So don't feel bad. Like if your noble's only going to score like six points or something, you, you you push more with decorations and the like. And there's a lot of scoring mid game. So it's, it's there, there's a lot of possibilities. Uh, haven't tried the solo mode yet, so we can't really speak about that. But so far, this is one of the few games that two-player does not actually feel bad. Mm -hmm. It still feels nicely nicely challenging, and there's a lot of wiggle room to do stuff. Um, we've tried a three-player game so far, and that was delightful. Yeah. It was a tight board because you felt like people kept eating up slots. <laughs> But it was such a delight. But we did end up with a line of nobles. Yes. <laughs> it could be like, it's the child and the empress and the whatever. And think about it. If it's four players with four nobles each, that's a lot of people in the freaking garden. So that's something. We have not actually played extensively Ghost Stories itself. Yes. That's also because of a quirk of the, the Kickstarter came with sleeves. But then there's not quite enough sleeves for everyone. For all the cards, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure. I think we're going to have to re-optimize and like unsleeve maybe the nobles. We still need more sleeves, bro. I thought I bought them. No, no. Remember the this is um because there were sleeves specific to the Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and we we don't necessarily have the same type. So I think we can swap out the nobles because then I can use other sleeves because the nobles the ones don't get mixed yeah, standard cards into also. decks. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's a minor it's a minor thing. So we have not played with the cats and the ghost tree. Because the cats, I mean, literally, they stare. It, where, where the cat is facing has an effect because, mm. you know, they affect spirits. Um, things like that. But uh, I see that the base game is available in gaming library if people are curious. It is currently selling for three three fifty because it is a ding and dented box from a price of three four fifty. But that is just the base game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know how to get your hands on the other expansions because they because they were essentially Kickstarter created expansions. So um, there are times when I, a lot of reviewers ridicule Kickstarter efforts where you haven't gotten the base game yet, and then you're obliged to have expansions. But this is definitely a case where it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's all beautifully done. The Golden Age expansion, which is really just mainly more characters and cards, um, you will jump into it. You can jump into it for your second game, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. You need one game to understand the rules, and then another game just to explore all these powers. And the the many, many scenario setups, mind blown. It's such a simple change, but it's it's quite awesome. And the fact that they do these presets instead of you... Um, just mixing all the decor together, that, that off-balances the game. Man. So you follow the scenarios. They're super fun. <sighs> Hang Garden! Any last words? Duck. <laughs> yes, the game has ducks. <laughs> so yeah, that was Tang Garden. We, we definitely recommend the game. We enjoy it a lot. Um, I actually wouldn't mind if they don't come up with more expansions. I hope that this is it. Although then I'm going to want to get the add-ons that we did not yeah. get during the I do want to see a digital translation. Yes. I, like, and I could imagine that would be super, like, you could have the features popping up from the ground. I, I want I want the digital expansion to be done the way that through the ages digital exp the digital version was done. Wherein you could flip between original and then you could flip to whatever mas version they have. Mm, okay. Because the original is already beautiful. 
And I'm sure when you do a digital version of this, there'll be certain variations. That Animations. They'll, do, that. they'll replace it with 3D models and this and that. So I would love to see I can't imagine doing things. line of sight and digital though. Then it'd be like, hmm. Or just highlight the areas. Uh, sorry, then Mitch has a question of, is it good for beginners? Uh, I feel like this can work. The scoring is difficult, but you just need an experienced player to guide everyone through scoring at the end. Even if you don't score high, I think you'll just end up with a pretty garden. Mm -hmm. um, Tokaido is still easier, I feel, in terms of like uh, that beginner aspect. Uh, yeah. versus this. Um, the game also has an official soundtrack, which is another stretch goal. It is mostly on Spotify. It's very short. It's a very short uh, it's a very short soundtrack. The soundtrack thus far has not lasted us an entire game. So uh, it's nice to fall back to the Tokaido mm -hmm. soundtrack. I know it's a completely different country, but um, it, it still sets the mood. Uh, and then the game, the games are quick and short. The box rates games to last forty-five minutes, and that's not a, not too far off the mm -hmm. mark. It's probably, but it's definitely under an hour to yeah. play the game once you kind of get all the rules together. And that'll be actually disappointing because you will see that parts of your board are still black and white. You have these irregular patterns. They're like, no, I want to complete the garden. So, mm -hmm. things to consider. Um. What else about this? It's, it's just very pretty. It's just very, very pretty. It's, it's definitely, um, yeah, I think the only pain we have now is the fact that this was a quarantine game. I mean, it arrived during the quarantine. Yeah. So we have not been able to, like, bring it out during big game nights. And I, I feel like it, it's very visual. It plays very well. It's something, I mean, we always take a lot of pictures of it at the end. and like, ah, oh, look at our garden. And the garden is different every time. But, uh, that's my main non relate non you know it's not part of the game's fault it's just we haven't been able to play it with folks and it's really a game that you want to like celebrate with friends and then have all of you explore the different views uh, the board game geek page also has examples of people who have painted the figures mm. oh my god they're super beautiful they're super super beautiful so uh, if we ever decide to commission painting, I think this is a good game for painted figures. It's like I wanna, I wanna give them life because if not, they 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 actually end up looking like statues yeah. in the garden. That's true. Oh, Ings is here and he asked if we played it while drinking Tang. No, because Tang is just sugar, <laughs> and then I can't have sugar anymore. Um, but thank you for this question. Other other notes to be. Uh, I guess that's it for me. Wow, well, yeah, it's, we've, we've already said a lot. But then we really, really love this game. Okay, and I'm glad that Toby... Actually, I wasn't... I did not know that Toby had backed it. <laughs> it just showed up one day <laughs> during the quarantine. Look, it's Tang Garden. So, yeah. Yep, so that was Tang Garden, our Monday board game uh, feature for this week. Uh, as always, every week we try to feature more games on Monday, so join us again if you can. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We had a lot of fun, and we hope you'll join us again next time. It's kind of amazing we haven't run out of board games yet to feature over, we're approaching 200 episodes. Just saying. Okay, so for questions or suggestions for future episodes, fill up the Google form at bit.ly, Badui Pride Ideas. You can follow us on Twitter, all Toby No Shade, RG Sunico. You can also check out our blog, BadayPray.com, for all the previous episodes and stuff about us. Feel free to continue the conversation in the comments below and let us know what you thought about the game. Are you excited about it? Or, no, I'm not going to give up Takenoko. It's my favorite garden building game. Explain why in the comments. And uh, be sure to subscribe for notifications, whether on Facebook or YouTube, so you don't miss our next live stream. Once again, I'm Rocky. And I'm Toby. And, and this, this is Badui Pride. Pride.